Th thank you all for showing up tonight. You're very, very kind and generous to give your time to our speaker for tonight's race, ethnicity, and identity event. Dr. Caroline Faria is an assistant professor of geography at Florida International University. And she is really, really one of the rare geographers that have engaged in both substantial field work in Africa, as well as uh, some activist research also throughout Africa and parts of the United States as well. We're, we're very fortunate to have her. She is um, currently involved in conducting some field work, as you can see, in the Sudan, which is the locale for her doctoral dissertation completed a few years ago. And so, as part of the Visiting Geographical Scientist Program of the International Geographical Honor Society and the Association of American Geographers, as well as this conference that is sponsored by the Social Sciences Department at Grand Rapids Community College, I'd like you to give a warm welcome to Dr. Caroline Faria. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, can you hear me at the back there? Yeah, you got it. Great, great, thanks. Um, thank you so much uh, for coming today. I, I should, first of all, thank um, the deans and the provost's office the Department of Social Sciences here at Grand Rapids Community College, Aquinas College. I had the, you know, the great opportunity to chat there yesterday. Um, and then the Gamma Theta Upsilon uh, um, Geography undergrad department, along with the AAGs who all uh, put together the funds to bring me here. It's really, really great to be here. Um, it's actually nice, would you believe it, to be able to wear some nice warm clothes. I'm coming from Miami, so it's... Uh, it's been fun um, flying over the, the lake there from Chicago and, and coming to see you all. Um, I'm going to be talking today about um, some field work that I finished up uh, a couple of years ago. And that, that, uh, um, I'm sort of in the process of developing into a new um, project. Um, but what I'd like to do is to start by talking about the broader arc of my research as a feminist cultural and political geographer. I know many of you here are taking geography classes, um, and so you know it's a chance perhaps to see what some of us geographers do. So I wanted to start uh, by talking a little bit about that. And then I'll talk primarily about uh, this, this piece of research on the beauty trade in South Sudan um, before I just segue a little bit at the end into some of my um, current research. And you know I really welcome your questions and comments as I, as I um, develop that project and try, try to get it funded, always the goal. Um, so I'll talk for about 45 minutes. Uh, um, I think any longer than that is probably too much for this, this late in the day. And I really do welcome your, your questions and, and comments. OK, so the last 10 years or so of my research um, on the, con uh, on the continent of Africa has included work on West and East Africa um, and the Horn, but has primarily uh, focused in on uh, the countries of South Sudan and more recently Uganda. And over that time, I've been centrally preoccupied with the question of nationalism and nation making. I've, uh, been, I've drawn here primarily on the work of Benedict Anderson, um, who's argued uh, quite formatively, uh, that although now we accept it as uh, the canon, um, at the time was quite formative in arguing that the nation was a socially, historically, and geographically imagined, right? Um, in part through powerful visual and printed materials like the ones we see here. And I've complemented his primarily Eurocentric work with that of uh, post-colonial scholarship of Said and Baba and Apta and Bembe and others, um, who've pushed the notion of the nation as a colonial fiction, but one that's taken up and reworked in varied ways by colonial subjects. I've also drawn on feminist work that's rethought the nation as embodied and performed, and those are really key ideas for me um, today enacted powerfully, but often mundanely through markers of difference, whether they be race, gender, class, or sexuality. Um, 
though this work has centered gender then, I've, been, I've found most productive those analyses of the nation that trace the powerful intersections of gender with race, class, uh, and, and other, other markers of difference. As I've shown in my own research, uh, the gendering of nation takes varied forms, perhaps through the assignation of distinct roles and responsibilities for men and women. Here you have the woman's battalion in Burkina Faso, that, that top image there, um, very much promoted by their revolutionary leader, Thomas Sankara. But more traditionally, I think we, we think of men as the sort of dis defenders of the nation uh, that go out to fight while women protect the home front, which is what you're seeing really in the third image down here. Uh, there's also the construction of idealized masculinities and femininities, such as those we see presented, uh, for example, and contested in beauty pageants, which have been a, a really important site of research for me, or through the symbolic construction of the male and female bodied bodies in varied ways as the nation, um, most notably through the feminization of national territory um, and the violent territorialization of women's bodies as part of a strategy of warfare. And these are some images that I use in my own geography classes to get the students thinking about the ways that the nation is always and already gendered and raced and sexualized, that we can't think about the nation or nationalism, um, even very mundane acts like singing a national anthem without thinking about the way that they're embodied. Though I've drawn on work outside of the discipline then, I do think that we as geographers, um, and many of you, you know, as geographers too, right, taking geography classes, have much to contribute to this conversation. Nationalism is, after all, marked by the socio-cultural, historical, geopolitical, and economic particularities of place, which geographers care very much about, and relationships between places. And it's bound up with key geographical themes, like those of boundary, territory, imaginaries of place, mobilities, and subject formation. And these are all central concerns in the social sciences, and uh, in geography in particular. And I think that feminist geography is uh, well positioned also to interrogate how the nation is produced across scale through the body, right? To think about the nation as deeply embodied. And that's something that feminist scholars across the social sciences and the humanities um, care very much about, thinking about uh, embodiment. So this kind of relational scale thinking, so thinking about the relationships across scale between the nation and the body, for example, is really at the heart of my research, um, which has, for the last eight years or so, focused on the formation of the new Republic of South Sudan. And in particular, I focused on this really rich period of nationalist activity between the signing of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in 2005 and, um, and the independence of South Sudan that occurred in July of 2011. So by way of some brief uh, background here, um, with the exception of about a decade of peace between 72 and 83, the Republic of Sudan um, was embroiled in a civil conflict that um, you know, emerged since its independence from British Egyp Egyptian condominium rule in 1956. And the roots of that conflict extended earlier even into that colonial period. Um, it's a, a very complex civil war, and it was, it was rooted really in what the foremost South Sudanese scholar Francis Deng has called uh, a war of visions, deeply conflicting imaginaries of the nation. Ethnic regional tensions have been heightened by the competition for land, cattle, water, gold, um, and most recently, oil wealth. Um, and faith is also uh, central here, with dominant successive government regimes imposing Islamic law and the Arabic language throughout the country. In contrast, the key opposition group, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, or the SPLM, has sought greater religious freedom and a secular political system along with, according to their motto, equality and justice. Um, for all Sudanese, not just uh, South, Southern Sudanese. So although the war is often portrayed as North versus South, what it's really been um, is, the, is the powerful government uh, based in Khartoum against uh, a whole set of very diverse um, but ethnically marginalized uh, communities. 
Um, <clears throat> so it's, very, it's been very complicated. Um, however, uh, the SP SPLM was uh, able to negotiate with the government as part of the peace process a referendum on independence for the South. And, and that was held in 2009. And two years later, indeed, uh, the South did secede. Um, also, although they still have many allies in the North uh, that are frustrated with the extant uh, administration. So as you can imagine, this period between 2005 and independence in 2011 was an incredibly rich one to be a geographer studying nation making and nationalism. The formation of the New South Sudan provides a particularly fascinating and novel case study of post-colonial independence taking place not 50 or 60 years ago when many African countries attained independence, but in the contemporary day. And amidst a new territory of neoliberal development and following not one, but uh, really multiple experiences of colonial exploitation and oppression, if we consider the government uh, of Sudan as a sort of a colonial force in what became the South. It's also an incredibly diverse region ethnically with a long history of inter-ethnic tensions in the South, which uh, have uh, you know, erupted again, unfortunately, quite recently. And so the nationalist imperatives of unity face many contestations, which are really interesting uh, for me to study uh, as, a, as a geographer, to think about some of the tensions simmering under the surface of this sort of um, facade of nationalist unity. So nationalist fervor over this time has certainly extended to the large and politically active South Sudanese diaspora, refugees of the conflict and their children who are scattered around the world, about 150,000 of them um, that, that live in the US. And my work, really, I became interested in South Sudan because I had two students uh, that I was working with at University of Washington. They were in my undergrad classes, and I was a teaching assistant. And they were from uh, varied re regions in South Sudan and grappling with um, the sort of uh, you know, uh, efforts towards peace uh, early in, in, the, in the 2000s. And they became very close friends of mine, and I worked with them in their community in Seattle, Washington, and, and the wider Washington State area. And when they started to go home, I went with them. And it was through them that I really got interested in, in the country. So my work has explored their diasporic, or what Glick Schiller has called long distance acts of nationalism and citizenship. In line with feminist and queer thinking of citizenship as performed and enacted by marginalized subjects such as refugees in seemingly apolitical spaces, I've paid attention to those acts of citizenship and nationalism taking place in community halls, churches, homes, and through vibrant virtual networks. Second generation youth, many of whom have never seen South Sudan, but who know it intimately through their parents' stories, um, have also been deeply engaged in the run-up to and following independence. They've been organizing in their communities to prepare for the referendum and then eventually independence. One fascinating case um, uh, that I've studied focused on the second generation and their, the role of popular culture in building a sense of nationalist uh, identity and connection in the diaspora. These are the winners of the 2007 Miss South Sudan USA beauty pageant, which is a hugely popular pageant that brings um, South Sudanese from all over North America and Europe um, to Kansas City, Missouri, and Washington, D.C. Uh, the pageant tends to rotate between those two cities. Um, and it really works powerfully to encourage um, Southerners to think of themselves as Sosa or South Sudanese um, rather than of their sort of ethnic um, origin, whether it be Kuku, Dinka, Nua, Latuho, or, or whatever. So there, there's a lot of promotion around the event that talks about, you know, we're an event by Sosa for Sosa, you know. Sometimes overlooked in feminist work on nationalism, idealized notions of men and masculinities also play an important role here. I love this image. This is a musician named Champion, and the image was created by a producer, a musician called Young David, who's actually um, far over to the left of the, of the poster that you see here. And um, this image really gets very nicely at the ways in which uh, men's bodies get 
bound up with, with nation making. And this is the South Sudanese, uh, the new South Sudanese national flag. And I was interested in the, in the work of men and idealized masculinities in the pageant, not through um, contestants, but as musicians and organizers and MCs, in sort of prompting um, a, a, a sort of bounded notion of the nation, a unified notion of the nation. And what was interesting about the guys was that behind the scene, there was actually a lot of conflict. There was a lot of contestation over the winners. There was some violence um, in the party scene that precedes and follows the pageant. There would often be gang-related violence that was inter-ethnic uh, violence. But it was very much smoothed over in, in the discourse around the event. And so that spoke, even though it's what might seem like a very trivial, you know, a beauty pageant, right? What, what's political about that? Actually, it, t it tells us a lot about um, the sort of political tensions simmering under the surface in South Sudan. So I've also paid attention um, in my work to emergent examples of transnational activism between uh, women in the US-based South Sudanese diaspora and those women that stayed behind in Sudan during the war. This is an organization I've been following for five years now, I'm working with for five years, um, called the South Sudan Women's Empowerment Network. And they began organizing in Phoenix, Arizona, you know, over uh, probably over eight years ago now, but they've moved back to South Sudan in this period of peace to start organizing there. Um, and they have chapters in all 10 states of the South, and they're very active, um, for example, in writing the new constitution and trying to get, for example, a marriageable age of 18 into the con constitution and some basic rights uh, for women. Uh, lastly, I've been fascinated by the very everyday acts of nationalism and citizenship that members of the diaspora are engaged in. Um, for example, through parenting practices, telling stories, cooking foods for your children to try and inculcate in them a sense of belonging and responsibility to home. And some of those young, younger generations are now actually um, going to South Sudan for the first time to work on national development. Uh, these, this is a couple that I met at the July Independence Day celebrations. And I, I loved his outfit. It captures very well what I was trying to think about in terms of um, the American flag and the South Sudanese flag that he's, he's literally wearing. But he's also trying to bridge those two worlds um, in, in his own uh, development efforts. <clears throat> So one of the main contributions of my work to theorizations of nationalism, transnationalism, and citizenship has been to expand those subjects, spaces, and scales that get to count as political. And this is an important imperative of feminist and other critical strands of political geography, to broaden the conversation and pay attention to often invisibilized and marginalized subjects, spaces, and scales, and make an argument that they're doing really important political work too. Um, so my work contributes uh, to uh, African studies um, on formal spaces and subjects of capital P politics, the work of political figures, most notably politicians and military leaders, and the spaces where they work, strategize, conduct warfare, or make peace. And feminist work attempts to do that by attending to those marginalized, trivialized, often feminized, and the seemingly apolitical subjects, parents, children, women, the abject figure of the refugee, the beauty queen, and the spaces through which they engage as political subjects, the home, the community, uh, the body, the stage. I demonstrate their central and indeed powerful, if mundane, work in bringing the nation into being. This is an image um, of the, the leader of South Sudan, Salva Kiir. He wears this uh, Stetson, always, uh, without fail. Um, and this is a, a protest involving the women from SWEN, South Sudan Women's Empowerment Network. And they're trying to hand over a petition regarding women's rights to the semi-autonomous government of South Sudan. This was before independence, um, when uh, Salva Kiir was also still vice president of the Republic of Sudan. So that um, early engagement, a very important work in sort of shifting the, the new nation's stance on women's rights. The research I'd like to speak to today 
um, retains this concern with those marginalized and overlooked subjects and spaces of politics, centering here on the burgeoning beauty industry in the newly independent South Sudan, and in particular, the space of the beauty salon. I'm interested in those spaces, and then those subjects, too, of highly mobile and entrepreneurial traders and saloonists, as they're colloquially known, or salon workers, and the clients whose bodies they style. The political importance of beauty really surfaced for me at a conference that I attended in 2008 that was set up by Swen, and that was designed to get women in, uh, in um, local sort of regional centers of the South to, to have a conversation about women's rights. Um, and so women would come and talk about really important issues, um, the violence that often came along with divorce, the lack of access to, pro uh, to property rights. Um, uh, persistent and ingrained violence against women and children in the household and the difficulties of um, getting prosecutions for that kind of violence. But they also would come with beauty products and hair to trade and share and, and really uh, beautiful clothes to trade and share. And so I found it interesting that in this uh, sort of space of women's empowerment, beauty was also central. And in some of the conversations about political sovereignty, women were also talking about economic sovereignty. And they were saying, you know, in this period of peace, there's a lot of people coming from outside, a lot of immigrants coming from outside with skills. They know how to braid hair. They know how to sew cloth. And they have skills, and they're taking away um, possible uh, opportunities for our own economic development, and we have to we have to respond to that. So, along with these political rights, they were sort of thinking about economic rights, and beauty was a central piece of that. Not dissimilar from a lot of the debates around immigration that we see going on all around the world, and and including uh, in the U.S. Um, as as problematic right as as those are. And I'll sp speak to that in a little a little moment. So the project's concerned with um, these elided subjects and spaces, but it's complicated and nuanced um, by what Pratt and Rosner, two uh, feminist political geographers whose work's been really important to me, by uh, what they call a global intimate framing. This is an elegant theorization of scale that engages with the vibrant emotional turn in geography and the wider so social sciences and, and humanities. You know, geog geographers have begun to reflect on the ways that emotions both reflect and are productive of place-based, geopolitical, economic, and socio-cultural shifts, analyzing feelings to better understand otherwise abstract processes like globalization, or in my case, nation-making. And it makes sense to us, right, that nation-making is deeply effective. The nation is produced through pride, love, hate, disgust, right? These very deeply rooted um, and emotion, uh, emotions. In theorizing the global intimate, they suggest that, quote, if the God's eye view of the global is visual because it's based on the principles of distancing, the intimate comes in close and supplements the visual with a host of other sense experiences. Sound, smell, taste, the way bodies and objects meet and touch, zones of contact and the formations they generate. Through its participation in the tactile, the intimate functions not as the opposite to the global, but as its corrective, its supplement, or its undoing. This framework troubles binary thinking of the global and the local, and that positioning of them in, in opposition with the global as masculine, as distanced and disembodied, and the local as somehow domestic or bodily or, or feminized. Instead, scale is rethought in this framing by examining the familiar and the embodied experiences of, after Mounts and Hinman, living and knowing the global. And this has been really important for me in thinking about international commodity exchange and the beauty trade um, as an ethnographer, as a geographer working in the field to, uh, to understand you know, some complex and abstract theoret theoretical ideas like that of globalization and nationalism. It enables me to think about globalization through its sensory experience, its grounding in the tired limbs of travel-weary traders, the aching fingers of stylists, the worry of balancing childcare and work, 
the relief, excitement, satisfaction of representatives who make that sale, the pleasure and anxieties too around consumption, around dressing up. This framing of scale is very useful, not only for thinking about globalization, but also for thinking in new and productive ways about the also abstract notion of the nation, which, as I said, is deeply effective. The set of feelings associated with nationalism are complex and multi-layered, pride, love, desire, ambivalence, panic, anger, and hatred. And they're powerful in structuring the practice of state bodies as well as everyday encounters. Moreover, these feelings are often heightened in or directed towards border spaces and subjects. As Agnew argues, lurking behind bordering everywhere is the effect of that nationalism which has come along with the territorial nation state. That being perpetually in question, national identity has to be constantly reinvented through the mobilization of national populations. Borders, because they're at the edge of the national state territory, provide the essential focus for this collective uncertainty. Though we often think of borders referred to here as the territorial boundaries of the nation state, we can also think about the ways that they're found inland, away from these edges, embedded in and marked, uh, marking national, non-national, and transnational products, workers, and capital and identified through emotion by the fear and desire directed towards foreign products, stylists, and their fashions. Thus, through the framing of the global intimate, this project aims to rethink the nation and nationalism by recognizing its emotion-laden quality and its production through these kinds of in-between, marginalized, feminized, and embodied border sites. This is insightful in the South Sudanese context Whereas I'll show, the nation is produced through the emotions brought on by the transnational, desires and fears around consumer sovereignty and cosmopolitanism, and around accelerated cross-border flows of products, people, and styles. Beauty as an empirical focus offers a rich lens, too, to explore the intimate, embodied, and gendered nature of nationalism, as well as its inflection by the deeply classed affects of cosmopolitanism. Beauty ideals are produced in place and are tied to particular economic, sociocultural, and political structures. The trade in beauty products, technologies, styles, and workers allows us to trace its increasingly globalized flows of commodities, ideas, and bodies that <coughs> contribute to nation making. And analyzing beauty as lived, enacted, and displayed opens up spaces to rethink the nation as performed. I'm going to put this concept to work um, now in a set of three vignettes and a series of related portraits that I took in the field. I really love thinking about research and methods and representational strategies, so I'd be happy to talk more about um, why I present the work that I do at the end. But briefly put, I feel it's a, uh, a strategy to rethink, recreate, and insist upon an idea of the nation as always in becoming, as performed, as felt and as embodied. So here we go. <clears throat> On July 9th, 2011, the Republic of South Sudan became the world's newest nation. As Independence Day approached, residents of the capital Juba busied themselves with last minute preparations, cleaning the streets, receiving dignitaries, practicing the new national anthem, and perfecting the military parade. Amidst this hectic schedule, hairstylists in the blossoming beauty industry work late into the night to ensure that their clients look smart for the big day. Most of those braiding hair, sewing weaves, and giving manicures had migrated from the border towns and capitals of the Congo, Uganda, Kenya, and Ethiopia, attracted by the profitable post-conflict economy. Migrant workers find they're in high demand for their cosmopolitan knowledge of the latest fashions, which are in turn reworking norms of self and South Sudanese national presentation, image, and identity. With them come flows of beauty products, including synthetic hair from Japan via Dubai, Kenya, and Uganda, and human hair from Malaysia, China, and India. Indeed, 
Beauty in South Sudan is emerging as a hugely profitable industry, mirroring the broader international flows of labor and transnational capital into the new nation. Beyond their economic import, I argue that these salons and the stalls of beauty products that stock them are also rich cultural and political sites of nation making, a process produced ambivalently around and through feelings of fear and desire. Clients clamor for the new and cosmopolitan styles, the latest technologies in hair and beauty, and the know-how brought on uh, by migrant stylists. Yet this desire is interwoven with a growing panic around the foreign. And I'll touch on three examples of this emotional contradiction today. Salon owners, traders, and migrant stylists in the beauty uh, industry are accused of profiteering and restricting homegrown development. Modern fashions are viewed by some as undermining South Sudanese conservative values, and fears of toxicity and poisoning are imbued in the discourses around cosmetic products entering the new nation from East Africa and beyond. The making of the nation in South Sudan is thus, I argue, fundamentally transnational, constructed not in isolation of, but explicitly through notions of cosmopolitanism and the modern exterior. And it's also emotional, marked at once by contradictory feelings of fear and desire that require and indeed depend on a foreign other. Zabib slopes across a revolving chair in her sister's salon, Oprah, in Atalabara, an area close to the uh, University of Juba. She allows her friend to brush her already washed and relaxed hair, playing with different ways to style it pausing every now and again to rub one or another product through it. Though she's South Sudanese, Zabib has lived most of her life in Uganda. But since the signing of the peace agreement in 2005, many Southerners like her have returned to the country. Juba has emerged as a vital hub for international development workers, small and large-scale private investors, and migrants from within Sudan, the neighboring countries, and the wider international diaspora. This has created a vibrant post-conflict economy with money flooding into and out of the city. Amidst the old buildings ravaged by war, darkened for need of electricity and pockmarked with bullets, there's a good deal of new development and signs of lots of money. Gradually, the often impassable roads in the center of Juba are being paved and widened to accommodate the multitude of SUVs that roll through the city. Within these imported cars ride South Sudanese men and women in suits, wearing expensive new watches and shoes, and preparing for meetings at the ministry with co-investors on their latest project, with co-workers at the UN, the World Bank, or any one of the many hundreds of NGOs now based in the city. These men and women need to look smart, and stylists like Zabib act as their guide. Perhaps unsurprisingly then, along with a host of new hotels, office buildings, market stalls, and housing developments, beauty salons have also become a visible part of the cityscape. In the busy ministries area, salons serve the government staff and often provide copy, shoe shine, and photo services to meet their needs. Upscale salons like Athiai line the area around Tong Ping, another popular neighborhood for government officials, and new gated housing developments, as well as the location of a host of new Lebanese, Indian, and Chinese businesses in the city. For those living on the outskirts of town in the rapidly developing suburbs of Gudeli, salons jostle with new gas stations and stalls selling imported construction materials and furniture. But for the best deals, clients head out to Jebel Market, which lies at the edge of the city under the shadow of the mountain. Pushed out of the city center as it develops, Jebel Market now provides a, a huge hub both for salons and traders supplying them, a city of stylists with streets of stalls, uh, stalls selling cosmetics and walls and walls of hair. The burgeoning salon industry in Juba is attractive for saloonists like Zabib and others I met, like Rukia and Lillian, pictured here, who met in beauty school and moved to the country from the Rift Valley province in Kenya. Compared with Nairobi and Kampala, it's far less competitive, and the Sudanese pound, which is the currency at use in the, at the time of the research, is very strong. By the, uh, yet the benefits of migration to Juba are counterbalanced with emerging problems of xenophobia. 
just as they're in demand for their know-how, in a moment they can be targeted by police and government workers demanding papers, landlords hiking up their rent, dangerous drunken soldiers at the tail end of a long night of partying, or by Southern clientele frustrated with their lack of personal gains since the signing of the peace and at a time when migrants seem to be doing so well. Many saloonists have stories of recent aggression and speak candidly of the mixed reception they receive from Southerners. When one salon owner, Margaret, opened her shop in Jebel just after the signing of the 2005 peace agreement, she found she quickly had a large clientele, but that her business was regularly the target of robbery, vandalism, and gun crime at night. She took to sleeping inside it, amongst her dryers and curlers, her shampoos and her conditioners, to fight off theft and property damage. Zabib and her colleagues were also recently targeted by a man who attacked their business, smashed mirrors and equipment with a few bruises and cuts that mark the salon and their bodies as sites of violence. Zabib suspects that the man was hired by her landlord, who she says is jealous of the profits that she's making, and who either wants to intimidate them into leaving or to paying higher rents. Salunas also spoke of the hostility they experienced by clients themselves, though they often noted that this depended on whether those Southerners in question had spent time during the war outside of the country. Um, so one noted, um, most people think that the foreigners are here to steal or to profit, and then they'll take the money away. They say, go and invest in your own country, right? These narratives that uh, really resonate, I think, uh, in many places. And then another said, if they stayed out, uh, outside during the war, if they left during the war, then they know what it's like to be a foreigner, so they're more sympathetic to us now that we're the migrants. But those that stayed in South Sudan uh, or Sudan during a war uh, are, are more difficult. Another stylist from Kenya also described this problem. She noted, uh, those Sudanese that stayed here can be backbiting. They're very much in Arabic. They, they haven't left during the war where they may have learned English in the refugee camps, like, like many that did. So they only speak Juba Arabic, and it's very difficult for them. They feel frustrated by um, the English that now is commonly being spoken in South Sudan. But still, they can be very excited about the salon, she says. They come in, and they want to get inside the dryer, to sit in the chair. They want to know everything that's going on. This last quote highlights how migrant saloonists are at once confronted with uh, xenophobic hostility, but also embraced. Even clients themselves can disparage the perceived dominance of the economy by foreigners, and yet be intrigued and drawn to the styles, fashions, and beauty techniques that they bring with them. The role of migrants in nationalist development has become a central part of political and popular discourse, regularly surfacing too in public debate about the future of the nation. Southerners acknowledge that there's a great need for their skills, but there's also a strong desire, as I spoke to earlier on, for self-development and economic autonomy and control. And so there's a fear that foreigners are exploiting the wealth of the South with little benefit to its citizens. This anxiety around perceived foreign profiteering underpins policies brought in by the new government of South Sudan that insists that all non-Southerners have a South Sudanese partner with a share in the profits and decision-making of the business. This shapes foreign direct investment in the country in powerful ways, with all major new construction projects from the new public basketball uh, stadium, street lighting, water treatment, hotel development, uh, road building, everything. Um, taken on by foreign companies with South Sudanese partners. And unsurprisingly, those partners tend to be those elites in political and or economic positions of power. And yet this anxiety is itself bound up with a desire to be part of a more open economic and sociocultural network and to participate in the fashioning of a new, more cosmopolitan nation. Elizabeth is approaching her fourth hour in one of the upscale salons along Tongping Road. She's chosen a synthetic hair weave made by the Ugandan company Darling, and the style is a straight ash brown that the hairdresser cuts into a sleek crop. All in all, the trip costs her 150 Sudanese pounds, about 50 US dollars, and she'll return in just a few weeks for a new style to replace it. Elizabeth is a South Sudanese woman who's lived for the last 15 years in the US, but she's recently returned to Juba to start working there um, 
uh, and build her organization for women's empowerment from the capital city. She's seen as wealthy compared to the many Southerners who stayed in the region during the war, but she's taking a considerable financial risk in moving home and giving up her nursing job in the US. Life in the city is incredibly expensive. Her rent is over $2,000 a month, and though partly subsidized by a friend in the government, accommodation, food, water, transportation, and electricity are all prohibitively priced as is common in post-conflict uh, nations. Yet she finds the money to visit this salon every few weeks, and for her, it's not really a luxury, she says, but a necessity. She says it's very important here to look smart, and not just uh, for the relatively wealthy. Clients describe, too, um, the importance of looking smart, and in order, uh, they said, to get ahead, um, they would miss meals um, or struggle to make rent so that they could make their salon appointments. One said, even if your clothes are not very beautiful, your hair and nails can be. At school, that's where it's cultivated. That's where you're told you have to look smart. If you don't look smart, you'll not be recognized as someone who's been to school. It doesn't have to mean high, high wealth. Even if life is not so smooth, some person will go to the saloon to get their hair and nails done. Looking smart means more then than just looking clean, though keeping the signs of exposure to heat, rain, and unpaved roads uh, at bay and nails, hair, and skin polished is often cited as imperative to success. Keep, keeping up with the new fashions entering the South from outside has also become an important preoccupation in the post-conflict moment. A marker, perhaps, of what scholars like Sousa Santos, Popke, Weiss, and others have thought about and some have critiqued um, as a form of subaltern cosmopolitanism. However, it seems as a fine line to tread between looking smart and embracing too readily the trends of the world outside of the borders of South Sudan. In the tumultuous days um, of adjustment following the peace, Women's bodies were deeply interwoven with nationalist discourse, with anxiety surfacing around style, um, how both the nation and its women should look. For example, in 2008, a series of arrests and beatings of young women wearing trousers prompted widespread discussion in the media about women's rights and what women can do and be in the new South Sudan. And most recently, there's been much debate and discernment around women chewing gum, hot tensions around women's comportment and the limits of women's rights in the new nation. And focused again on a material object, a commodity that's seen as foreign, uh, gum, although ironically, uh, most gum that we eat actually contains uh, um, uh, you know, Arab gum, Ar uh, Ar Arabica gum that comes from Sudan, but it's uh, you know, a, a foreign product that women are, are chewing and a practice, right, of, of chewing that's seen as anathema to the ideal of the good South Sudanese girl, particularly one for whom a bride price has been paid. So part of this news article talks about the, the horrors of these girls in Jongole State who've been chewing gum, and that even their bride price has been paid and they're still chewing gum, right? Similar anxieties have surfaced over the popularity of beauty pageants, um, and this speaks to some of my earlier work. Um, the appropriateness of Western rather than traditional dress during the competitions, and whether hair weaves styled after Beyonce and Rihanna can truly be representative of a good South Sudanese woman. These are two of the most popular types of weaves, and they're named after um, Beyonce and Rihanna. Indeed, women's style has become centered in nationalist debates and remains an area of contestation and anxiety with competing imaginaries one that's more conservative, nostalgic, and parochial, and one that positions the new South Sudan as modern and firmly oriented outwards. And these case studies really resonate with historical work on the disruptive power of the cosmopolitan modern girl around the world in the 1920s to the 1940s. Um, and she was a subject that emerged in the US, Australia, China, Germany, and South Africa, um, and I'm thinking about the, the, um, the modern girl, right, as a heuristic in the contemporary post-colonial and newly independent African context. Again then, beauty, style, and the salon industry have emerged as distinctive, if contested, markers of the new nation, and are both desired and worried over. 
So, though deeply controversial, key to the success of the salon industry is the importance of looking smart and the newly constructed desire of post-conflict subjects to embody cosmopolitanism through technologies of the self. Access to these technologies um, are enabled through heightened mobilities and emerging transnational connections to East Africa and afar, Dubai, East and Southeast Asia, Europe, Latin America, and, and the US. These transnational connections are a key part of the new political, economic, social, and cultural development of South Sudan, yet they also threaten its integrity, the boundedness of the nation-making project. Perhaps best embodying this contradiction, then, are those subjects who are at once national and transnational. Southerners returning to the South and contributing to the development of the country, but doing so through their heightened and ongoing mobility. Levi is one such subject. When stylists run low on a particular lotion, relaxant, or type of weave in Jebel Market, they'll cross the busy streets of stalls to a stretch brimming with cosmetic products, selecting what they need from the stocks that have freshly arrived from Kampala and Nairobi. If they've worked in Jebel for just a little while, they know which trader will certainly have what they need, and if he doesn't have it, he'll tell you that he has a far superior alternative. Levi, like many of the traders in cosmetic goods working in Juba, is a young man in his 20s. He's South Sudanese, but again, he spent much of the war traveling outside the country in Uganda, Congo, and Kenya, where he's learned how the markets work, the best trading routes, how to manage border guards, and a host of import taxes, legitimate or not, so that he can enter South Sudan with the ability still to make a profit. Levi started selling at the age of seven on the streets of Kampala, gradually building up his stock and his savings. He paid his own way through school while he worked, recently completing his A-levels. He uses his connections with family and friends scattered throughout East and West Africa during the war to build supplier networks. His stall in Jebel Market is one of the largest selling hair and beauty products, taking up two lots and positioned lucratively on the corner of two streets brimming with busy salons. His stall is filled to bursting with products and he wants to expand further. And to keep it this well stocked, he remains incredibly mobile. Since South Sudan has virtually no sector for the manufacturing of beauty products, as is the case for most other goods, all of these are imported by traders like Levi and they're produced in a wide range of countries with a complex commodity chain. Every two weeks, he takes the bus down to Kampala to scope out Majestic Plaza, Mukwano Arcade, and Dazlan Market for the best deals. He knows the markets of Nairobi well too, and he also buys fake real hair from Nigeria and Togo. His trips to Dubai are rarer, but he goes there to purchase products cheaper still than they'll appear in East African markets, and to access rarer finds, real, real hair, human hair, directly from Dubai, where it enters the markets from China, Malaysia, and India. His business, and those of other traders like him, is a lucrative one. Products brought from outside of South Sudan cost two to five times the price in their local market, in part to pay for the cost of shipping, but also in response to the desire for foreign hair products in a country that cannot yet compete with the exotic promises of lotions and weaves and polishes from afar. Levi shows me a sample of his goods, curl activators and cuticle cleaners, uh, you know, products I didn't know existed before I started this project, are twice the price for clients to purchase in Juba than they are in Kampala. He buys hair at about 10 Sudanese pounds and sells it here for 30. So thus, while the country struggles to develop a manufacturing sector, neoliberal, transnational, and entrepreneurial subjects like Levi continue to profit. Now, leaving Levi's store for a minute, I, I want to reflect on his mobility and that of the material objects he trades in, um, and, and to digress to think about some of my new, newer research di directions. Levi's story really captured my curiosity in the field, and I returned the following summer to the shopping malls and transport hubs that Levi described to me in Kampala, Uganda. During that same field trip, I spent time in Dubai to check out that stage of the commodity chain, attending a very large and vibrant uh, trade fair uh, that's uh, shown here that brings cosmetologists, buyers, manufacturers, and clients to Dubai from all across the world. 
Certainly the markets of the Middle East and particularly Iran are a huge draw for actors in this industry to this uh, trade fair. But so too I found through my interviews uh, increasingly are the very cosmopolitan markets of Lagos, Accra, Dakar, Kinshasa, Johannesburg and the East African capitals of Nairobi and Kampala. Part of my new work then explores this piece of the commodity chain, the emergent global circuits of capital and commodities flowing through the Middle East to Africa that have largely been ignored in this sort of grounded and embodied lens um, in the scholarship. And that I'm going to explore through the case study of the hair trade. Uh, these are some of the smallest shops in uh, the Dubai's Old Town, the, the image furthest over there, and the top two images, where primarily Ghanaian and Ni Nigerian traders are buying and selling hair in small amounts. Um, uh, and then the Jebel Ali free trade area that wouldn't let me in, um, but I have to find another way to get in there next time, um, where, the, where much larger bulk product is moving, is moving through. In doing so, um, I also seek to challenge dominant narratives of Africa and Africans as the recipients of globalization, and usually in a negative light. As such, I'll also be conducting a business history of an African-located manufacturing company called Darling Limited. They make synthetic hair using plastics imported from uh, Japan, um, and that Lillian, Rukia, Zabib, and the other stylists um, that I spoke with in South Sudan most commonly use. And this factory is very interesting because in many ways it, it's an example of the sort of Africa rising neoliberal discourse of like, look how Africa is doing so well. It has this vibrant manufacturing sector. But um, on visiting the plant and, and following some of the events around the plant in um, uh, last year, then I started to find out that there are a lot of um, labor disputes around conditions in the plant and sort of uh, you know problematic experiences of the primarily female 200 braiders that, that work there. Lastly, to extend uh, the commodity chain analysis um, to a focus on consumption, um, I'm going to be complementing this analysis of trade and manufacture with an interrogation of the cultural political economies of consumption um, in uh, Kampala and their implications for um, new stylings of African subjectivity in the East African region. And here I'm interested in the thinking about the intersections of gender and the ideal femininities um, with class, race, and emotion. So really thinking about what, what norms are being projected here and how are they raced, classed, and gendered. Um, however, that's for the future. Right now, we're in Levi's stall uh, in Jebel Market, and I noticed that his animated demonstration of skin clarifying lotions, perfumes, and hair dyes takes a serious turn. It seems that the very transnationality of these products has also prompted anxieties that touch just as concerns around foreign workers and their foreign styles on the integrity of the nation. He assures me that all his products are originals and that he never trades in expired goods. He says he works hard to travel regularly to build his reputation in this regard. His somewhat surprising insistence speaks, I later learned, to recent poisoning scandals in which poor quality counterfeit cosmetics and chemical treatments from abroad have been implicated in the death and disfigurement of South Sudanese. The incidences are part of a, a body of rumor around the deliberate poisoning of Southerners by non-Southerners, both within the South, but also in the northern capital uh, cities of Khartoum, and in countries like Egypt, where Southerners have been living in exile. The case of poisoning through cosmetics, but also pharmaceuticals and liquors, has caused a public outcry around the lax regulation of imported goods. The inability of border staff to control the growing flows of imports, and a sense that outsiders pose a rising threat to the economic as well as the biological integrity of the South Sudanese body. Again, the dramatic rise in the trade in cosmetics speaks to the desire for them and the reorientation outwards of the economy and the individual. But it also highlights the collective anxiety about this new order of things. So, to conclude. 
South Sudan's newly emerging beauty industry is deeply bound up with the making of the nation and offers valuable insights into broader transnational political and economic shifts at work in the contemporary moment. These include the re-entry of Southerners like Zabib home and their efforts to negotiate the political economy of the country, the tense debates closely followed by Elizabeth and other clients around cosmopolitanism, modernity, and what it means to be and style a South Sudanese citizen. The significant role of migrants like Rukia, Margaret, and Lillian in the nation-building process, and the international flows of products into South Sudan by traders like Levi. Through an engagement with a global intimate framing, this project has sought to make sense then of a national intimate at work in the new South Sudan, a nation that is being produced through transnational flows of bodies, ideas, and products, and has lived and imagined by distantly located members of the diaspora, returnees, or migrants. This framing is instructive in theorizing nationalism as performed through the bodies of stylists, clients, and cosmetic traders, and in everyday spaces like the beauty salon. But observing nationalism through the lens of beauty also highlights its deeply ambivalent, contradictory, messy, and always emotional nature. Fear and panic are bound up with a desire and an embrace of the trade. Anxieties around the ownership of businesses by foreigners, the transgressions of new modern styles, xenophobia directed at foreign stylists, and the fearful rumors of poisoning from imported beauty products are also important to pay attention to. They speak to the instabilities, the tensions, and the ruptures emerging as Southerners and non-Southerners style a new nation, one that is transnational, cosmopolitan, and turbulently reoriented outwards. Thank you. Caroline, thank you so very much for a profound delivery on, on this subject of, of South Sudan. And before I open up the floor for questions, I have a question. And, and it's, it's, um, it's interesting. I saw this theme prevalent that seemed throughout your presentation, and that is this. We have uh, uh, Dinka and perhaps Bari coming into the United States from South Southern Sudan. Did they become South Sudanese in the United States? And they developed that sense of nationalism in the US. And so is Elizabeth now a South Sudanese in oh. Sudan, South Sudan, mm -hmm. as opposed to what was she before she left? Yeah, I mean, the, I, I love, before independence, uh, people were, uh, that lived in the South would either identify ethnically or as Southerners, I think. Um, and then absolutely in the US, uh, when independence happened, people were very keen to get their passports, their South Sudanese passports, and people would often correct one another and say, no, we're, we're now South Sudanese. So if you go to public events and um, people would refer to themselves as Sudanese, others would correct them and say, no, no, now we're South Sudanese. It, it's very interesting because it's analogous, I think, to my grandparents who came, who came from that country that's shaped like a boot mm -hmm. to the United States, and they came as uh, Napolitans from Napoli, oh, and they became Italian yeah. in America. Yeah. Well, I think part of it is that in the in the um, in the U.S., they want to identify as South Sudanese, not Sudanese, um, because of the long history of conflict. But in uh, South Sudan too, there's a there's a huge amount of pride around a South Sudanese identity. And that's in tension with ethnic identity. I think that there's some efforts to project the, a South Sudanese-ness that erases ethnicity, and then mm -hmm. some efforts to say, oh, we're like multi-ethnic South Sudanese, let's celebrate those differences. Yeah. Fascinating. Do we have questions? Questions, OK. Go right ahead. Okay. Want to stand? Want to introduce yourself? Our speaker for tomorrow evening, by the way, Dr. Decker. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for a really exciting talk, and I, I see so many obviously parallels in our work, Great. and I wish that you could be here tomorrow because, um, and hopefully I'll be here tomorrow because I'm gonna. 
Over bring up some of the themes again and again. Great. But my question, I have a, a bunch of questions, but I'll just limit it to two. Okay. Um, so the two uh, that I want to ask you about, the first is, um, do you have, what are your thoughts about some of these alternative beauty pageants mm. that are uh, being really kind of promoted and celebrated throughout the world? I'm thinking of things like Miss HIV Positive, mm. uh, Miss Landmind, and yeah. uh, landmine victim or, or, or survivor. Um, and what these pageants represent in terms of identity projects, you know, mm -hmm. are they really about the nation? Are they about other kinds of identity construction? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about your thoughts on those and whether those are something to be celebrated by feminists as alternative spaces of resistance or as kind of reinforcing these troubling stereotypes. Okay, so that's a long first question. Mm -hmm. My second one is very easy and it is, um, what is the state of skin lighteners mm. in terms of the beauty trade in, in South Sudan? Okay, great. Thank you. I'll start with the second question then. Um, you know, skin lightening creams are one of the uh, largest, um, you know, they make the most money out of beauty products around the world. They're hugely popular. Um, and a lot of the interesting literature on, um, um, on beauty looks at skin lighteners. And so I've really been drawing on that a lot in thinking about hair. And um, I think hair is complicated. I, I, I think that there's a set of arguments around hair as a way to whiten oneself. And I think, um, you know, a, a lot of the hair that, that is sold is long and straight. And um, even the places it's sold from, there's like a racial hierarchy that's very, uh, sort of, just very under the surface, uh, very racialized um, hierarchy around the cost of hair. And I think the closer it is to the long, straight, sort of white ideal, the more expensive it, it gets. Um, and that came out very clearly in the beauty world trade fair. People would talk about cost of hair and what was good hair and what was less good hair, and it was very racialized. But I think, too, it's a, it's a bit problematic just to say, um, for me to say that it's a whitening project. Because I think um, it, the saloonists are incredibly creative, and they're reworking styles in place. And so they will talk about different styles, like the Kampala styles versus Nairobi, and how far behind Juba is, and how they use colors and, and braids in different ways. So I think that they're reworking hair um, in, in important, grounded ways. And I think they're also tapping into these like global uh, diasporic circuits of blackness. So you know, Rihanna and Beyonce are, are popular styles. And I think they're um, this uh, sort of reaching for something other than like a whiteness project. Um, but the skin lightening uh, literature is really, really interesting. Um, in the beauty pageants, a lot of the debates are around, are around blackness. So they want the women that win to, to really represent this sort of black is beautiful ideal. And actually, a couple of years ago, a, a fairer, um, uh, like a, a, a you know, lighter skinned contestant won um, and there was a huge amount of you know, dispute over the forums over whether she was really South Sudanese. Um, you know, and the, and the, the sort of myth of South Sudanese as, as, a, as black and North Sudanese as, as non-black is actually a fiction because there's huge diversity across the country and many, many hundreds of years of um, you know, uh, great sort of uh, mixing of communities and trading routes and, um, and so, um, but this part of this sort of nationalist imaginary is around blackness. Uh, so their skin lightening creams are there and um, some of the problems around um, lax regulations concern these skin lightening creams which are incredibly toxic um, and, and, and also the hair dyes and stuff and the henna products that aren't regulated are very, can be very damaging. Um, you know, one of the reasons, the beauty pageant question, one of the reasons I think beauty pageants are so fascinating and, and like lots of feminist scholars have studied beauty pageants, you know, it's really, is because it is so rich and contested. And I think that um, there's a way as a feminist geographer going into this project, I didn't want to, um, I wanted to have a lot of problems with the pageant and the, the different pageants. But I just found it was just much more complicated than I was able to, um, that, that I, that, so I couldn't really come down on one side or another. The, the pageants in the US are really a platform for young female and male South Sudanese um, men and women to, uh, to 
to you know show off their 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 talents, the musicians and the MCs and the DJs and the photographers, as well as the contestants who are very well educated, articulate. You know the pressure on women pageants; they have to be smart and want a career, but but also want a family, but not have had kids. Right? There's all these pressures on them to be all these things, which is problematic. But you know they're they're they are sort of seen as showcasing the nation, and so in that way. Um, you know, they were they were amazing events. I think, um, of course, and, and always the joke was, why don't we have a Mr. South Sudan? And then there'd be a laughter, and then nothing would happen. So, um, you know, I think it just speaks to the ways that women's bodies get bound up in nationalism in different ways than the men's bodies do. I think the question about Miss Landmine and Miss HIV, I mean, most of the literature on beauty pageants has been on the gendering of nationalism. But these other beauty pageants, I think they really, they, they get at something that we can use that literature for, but it's really different. Um, it's about how women's bodies get taken up in other ways. And for HIV, it's long, it's long been the case that women are the bearers of protection against HIV. They're seen as the ones who have to spread the word about HIV and educate people about HIV. Um, but in the in in the African context, not in the U.S. context, they're also seen as the the victims of HIV, primarily, or the ones who are sh spreading HIV, right? The scapegoaters, um, prostitutes. So women's bodies have been b tied up with HIV in lots of complicated ways, and so I think this is just another way that it comes to the surface. Here we have another question. Uh, yes, I wanted to know. Oh, excuse me. I don't have to say my name, do I? No, you don't. Oh, have to okay. Say your name. I wanted to know is you that. You can give a fake name if you want. Oh, okay. Is that uh, like a trend that more African women now want more beauty products and salons around the uh, surrounding developing African countries? Mm -hmm. And do they face the opposition that the uh, saloon, salon owner, owners face in the uh, Sudan? Um, yeah, I mean, the beauty industry is really vibrant on the continent. Um, and South Sudan is, is quite far behind, actually. Most, you know, Kenya, Uganda, East Africa, Congo, West Africa, and S Southern Africa. I mean, the, the beauty um, industry is, is really, really vibrant. There are salons everywhere um, that, you, that you go in, in, in sort of urban centers, at least. So, for Juba in South Sudan, this is a newer industry, but it's really taken off. And a lot of the migrant workers say, well, we've trained in Kampala or Nairobi, but it's so competitive because everyone is in the industry. But we can come to Juba, and there's no one here yet, so we get all the business. So um, it's really uh, lucrative for the saloonists that, that go there um, now, right now, um, because they don't have their, their sort of own industry. So, yeah. Uh, another question here. My name is Matthew Hamby. I'm a student here at GRCC. I was just wondering, do you think the transnational globalization movement in South Sudan is headed in the wrong direction, ignoring the larger picture, or is it truly helping the people of Southern Sudan? Oh, good question. Well, I like these questions that are difficult to answer, right? Because um, uh, I, it's those complexities that I think I'm, I'm trying to get at. A lot of the narratives um, I, in the talk yesterday, I was talking about this, uh, this uh, two economist front covers that a lot of social scientists have talked about. And one is in, uh, from 2000, and it, um, you know, it was about the hopeless continent, you know, Africa, and it has this image of this guy with a big machine gun. And then the other economist articles from 11 years later, and the title is Africa Rising with this little boy with a kite. So you have these two dominant na narratives, which are ideologically rooted in, uh, you know, the sort of Kaplan-esque, um, uh, you know, Malthusian idea that Africa is descending as ever into the dark continent misery. And then this neoliberal narrative of, you know, neoliberalism is going to save Africa, and Africa is the new... Um, the new sort of site for that. And I think, of course, it's much more complicated than that. And the Darling Factory is really interesting to me because it gets at that, those tensions. So the, the um, oh, I haven't got the image here, but the, uh, uh, the owner of that factory really espoused this sort of neoliberal idea that he's bringing jobs. Um, he's a Lebanese, uh, Ugandan. He's been there 25 years. We're bringing business. We're, we're, we're hiring people. 
Um, the same kinds of debates that you see going on in the US, right? And then, um, you know, some of the workers agreeing with that. This is great work. This is, I can, I can send my kids to school. And then other, others really saying that this is, uh, this is exploitative work and the hair products are being sold for so much more than we're getting paid and there's, there's threats of electrocution. And um, so you have those competing narratives. And, it, and it's just the same. Um, in South Sudan, right? There's this idea that globalized products are um, are undermining our authentic South Sudanese, which is a fiction, right? Because you know what is authentic? Anything. Um, and then these ideas that no, we've been at war, we've been isolated for so long. We want to engage with um, the exterior, and and that's happening very much in the East African region. So they're part of the East African uh, community, the trading community now. But also, a lot of the products entering South Sudan from Thailand, Malaysia, you know, the UK, Latin America. It's really fascinating. Thank you very much. We have one more question. Um, if we can go back to the picture of the girls for a moment. Sure. Um, do you find that because there was such a large um, migrant migration from that area to the U.S. Um, that the people coming back aren't willing to sort of shed their American skin, um, and that you know you can kind of look at these people and if you took them out of this context and put them in the mall yeah. downtown, you know, down in Granville, they wouldn't be um, odd. They wouldn't look. African, um, and I ask this because uh, my husband is Ghanan, and he is very, they are very, find it very important to look their part in the world mm -hmm. so that they sort of can spread their sociological mm -hmm. um, ideologies and address what it is to be African, and especially when we go back with our children they, you know, will comment, oh, you look so American, yeah, you know, true. and especially like the jeans um, aren't popular. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of a novel I just uh, finished called um, We Need New Names by um, this great writer, um, no, um, no Violent Bulawayo, and also the book, um, Americana that just came out uh, recently. Those are two books that get at some of the tensions uh, for of, of Africans, one Zimbabwe and one Nigerian, who move to the U.S. and suddenly all the responsibilities that are placed upon them to perform Africanness. And and for those two women in both novels, they say, "Before I went to the U.S., I didn't consider myself African. I considered myself Nigerian or Zimbabwean." And so I think a part of that performance to dress. Um, and eat Ghanaian and all that stuff is is a, is is, be, is part of the, of the responsibility of, of being part of the diaspora in the U.S. and also part of um, communicating your your identity to your children who uh, might not otherwise get you know visit Ghana that much or visit home that much, right? So um, so I think that's an important piece of a sort of diasporic identity. These women are actually from Uganda, and they've never been to the U.S. but I mean, one thing I'd say about them is, is, yeah, a lot of the products that they're wearing and a lot of the stuff in their shop is, um, is perhaps from the West. A lot of it isn't. A lot of those posters, for example, are from the Congo and, uh, and, and from within uh, Africa, which has you know, vibrant manufacturing industry, and a lot of that stuff's coming in from there. Um, so, so yeah, there is a way that they're referencing the USA and perhaps you know, the mall experience in, in the US. But um, they probably bought those, um, those clothes in, in this mall here, which is uh, one of the main malls in Kampala. Um, you know, and and for, for them, that's, that's probably what they view as Kampalan style rather than um, you know, American style or anything like that. So I think, um, um, I think the notion of looking African, right, w what does that really mean? Because um, we, we might have an idea of what looking African me means, and it, and it might not resonate at all with people that, that live there. Um, and so I think that that's why I'm kind of interested in tracing these commodities and how they're performed and what that means for the subjectivities of those, of those people. Um, I don't know if that answers your question. But. Certainly a uh, significant factor in globalization, for sure. Mm -hmm. Personal dress. 
We I mean, assume it's westernization, and perhaps it is. Oh, yeah, but, and, and, but perhaps not, right? I mean, um, perhaps not at all. Probably most of those products are, are either made in China or, or, um, um, or you know, the, the recycled clothing industry is also really big in, on the continent. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think... Yeah, I mean, I think, um, um, you know, the questioner was just saying that in, in West Africa, there is a sense of, um, you know, preserving our particular um, national identity or regional identity that you don't see in cosmopolitan centers like Joburg, say. Um, and, and I would say that African nationalism um, in the post-independence era, like 60s and 70s, the sort of pan-African nationalism that we saw then, that was really bound up with dressing, quote, African and, and performing African dances and stuff. And a lot of those were fictions, actually, that they were, um, you know, they were, you know, inventions of the time that, oh, now we're going to have the, the girls sing this song in school or whatever it may be. Um, and it's the same in South Sudan. I mean, there was a big competition for the new national anthem, and it's really difficult to sing, but there was all this effort in the months going up to independence to learn the song, so that this becomes somehow authentically South Sudanese. And it, it, was, it was like a, one of those singing competitions, um, like American Idol, where you, you come up with it. It's a, it's a fiction. Um, but definitely in South Sudan, there is this tension between this imagined and conservative, like, authentic South Sudanese dress, unusually ethnic regional, and then um, the other sort of modern that are in tension. But really, I would say they're both cultural fictions. I'd like to uh, close our session. But before we do so, please note, you're certainly free to come up and ask Dr. Freya some questions after we um, give her a round of applause and thank her for her time here. Thank you very much. Thanks.